Um, thank you very much for your introduction. Should I call you Father? Ed? Yeah, lovely. Um, this is a very special night for me. So, I'll start by um, thanking Nicholas and his wife and the children who have Im invited me here. Without them, I would not have known Luxembourg. So I now know Luxembourg, and I'm proud to be here. Um, I'm not the first African um, to write poems or to read, but in my search, I didn't go to Wikipedia because <laughs> I don't believe in it. No, I do. Um, I discovered that there was a, a very important African who comes from Senegal, um, who first wrote a poem about Luxembourg. Um, I came across it, and I decided I was going to read it, but uh, I've decided against that. <laughs> because I, this is my night. <laughs> um, <clears throat> let me show you who I am. Uh, I'm really nobody. But I belong, as they say, to the third generation of African writers. The first generation of African writers are those who wrote immediately after um, the European, I think we can call it Union now, the scramble for Africa sent Europeans out into the African continent. And the missionaries went there as well. The first crop of African writers are those who wrote about the coming in of the white man on the African continent. The second crop of the Af African writers are those who were trained. Um, they went through an education, which was European education. And there are two types, effectively, depending on how the empire behaved. The French, Portuguese ruled African colonies by what they called direct rule. The English, in their laziness, ruled Africa through chiefs indirectly. Now that affected everything that happened To them. As a result, you will have known and seen some of the effect. If you came from Senegal, French speaking world, um, Leopold Sengo, not only was he um, a very important person, but he became the president of. Senegal, but he also took a chair in France. This in British speaking colonies did not happen. So the writings that came out from French speaking, Portuguese speaking, and anybody who ruled Africa directly was different from that 
which came from English speaking. To cut a long story short, because that's not what I came here for, I came to read from my poems. Uh, we tend to hear more about Africa, from Africa or about Africa, we tend to hear more um, from French speaking or English speaking. Um, and that those two divisions are important. Whatever is happening now, actually, between blacks and uh, Europeans and so on, is actually dependent on that. Because if you came from a French-speaking colony, you became a citizen of France. And therefore, the French accepted you. There were academic associations which accepted uh, Leopold Senghor and David Diop and others more directly. Whereas, if you came from English-speaking colonies, you had Chinua Achebe, Wole Shoinka, Ngugi Wathiongo from East Africa, the rest from West Africa. Most of those um, did not have uh, as much free place within the English society as the French speaking had. Now this does not mean that the French, the English were more racist than the French. We can talk about that later. <laughs> so I come, they say, from the third generation of African writers. What is, what is the third generation of African writers? We were born during the colonial period, but we grew up after independence. So that has a very important effect on what we write about, what we are influenced by, and so on. So that, um, our generation not only was able to, to be inspired by European civilization and the um, ballad of um, Red Jail, which has been quoted, um, was read by us. And recently, before I retired, I taught from Reading, Ballad of Reading Jail, I introduced a course called Literatures of Incarceration. So I taught four years in Leeds and four years in Newcastle University, and it was a fabulous course. It was a lovely course talking about what happens to prisoners. And it doesn't matter whether the, who the prisoners were. Um, let's stop that subject, because uh, I'm not here to preach. I'm here to read from my poems. Good. Then how did I begin writing? I began writing with given European literature, which I went through, but the English-speaking world not only took up European literature, but they allowed us to study our African literature. So I started writing at a time when I was able to look at my African environment and use that as metaphors or descriptions of my writing. So the first poem which I wrote, which I'm going to read to you, is actually based on an African story, which turns out to be a, a, a European story as well. It's a world story. 
A story is very simple. It's a folk tale. The chickens, which were eating, were complaining to their master once. They said, we have a very strange master. When he protects us every day and gives us food, but when visitors come, he chooses one of us, kills them for the visitor. This we do not understand. This is the chicken complaining. Now, we used this to talk about what was going on in our country. If you are an ordinary lecturer or teacher, um, you were not safe. And so we too cried the song of a chicken. So song of the chickens, master, you talked with bows, arrows, and catapults once. Your hands teeming with hawk blood to protect your chicken. Why do you talk with knives now? Your hands teeming with eggshells and hot blood from your own chicken. Is this to impress your visitors? Now we discovered that our government would not allow some of us who were thought to be radical. There was really nothing about us. As you can see, I wouldn't, I wouldn't pick up a gun to shoot anybody. And, and so this went on. I would now like to read another poem I wrote. Um, what is my other book? Yeah. This one is It's called New Platform Dances. Now, as early as the 60s, Africa also had plus platform shoes. And during my time, everybody was excited about platform shoes. And then we had two ways of approaching the subject. It's either platform shoes, civilization, but also we discovered that the platform was being used as a political. Um. So here is a man who knows how to dance in the traditional world, and he knows how to, to make reins to get the rains to come, to go and uh, appeal to the gods. But during the time we had platform shoes, um, this man discovered that he, his power was no longer there. So he wondered why is the new generation behaving the way they are behaving? And we, um, what is wrong with the power I had is what he is crying about. And he's using choppy. Choppy is a type of dance amongst the, the Lomwes of Malawi. And if you are a choppy dancer, you are you have the power and energy to go to the gods, taking your dance with you and pray to them, to the gods, and the gods will come in, will bring rains. 
the new platform dances. Haven't I danced the big dance, compelled the rains so dust could soar high above like when animals stampede? Haven't I in animal skins wriggled with amulets, rattled with ankolets, scattered nervous women with snakes around my neck, with spears in these hands, then enticed them back with fly whisks magic. Haven't I moved with all concentric in the uh, arena to the mystic drums dancing the half nude long way dance? Haven't I? Haven't my wives at motors sang me songs of praise, of glory, how I quirked the earth, how my skin trembled, how my neck peaked above all dancers, how my voice throbbed like the father drum I danced to, haven't they? Now when I see my daughters writhe under cheating abstract, Voices of slack drums, you can lure it to babble men ideas, masks without amulets or ankulets. Why don't I stand up to show them how we danced chopper, how it was born? Why do I sit still? Why does my speech choke like I have not danced before? Haven't I danced the bigger dance? Haven't I? And he discovers that he has not really danced the bigger dance. Uh, he has been beaten by the new generation. One of the things, one of the items that is critical for writers of my generation is um, we get our initial education in Africa, and then we transfer to the metropolis to get our second degrees. And then we go back to teach. And we discover that we are not promoted in the jobs until you get a PhD. So you go back to Europe to get a PhD so that you are promoted. Now, if you go back, you teach, you'll be very lucky not to be arrested. So, this is my life. Start at home, go to Europe, get, first, get, the, first, get, get the first degree. Go back to teach, not satisfied with it. Go back to Europe, get a PhD, go back to teach, and then get arrested. And then after the arrest, unfortunately, the very Europe you tried to leave after PhD, you tried to say, I'm not coming here again, I've got my PhD, I'm going home. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, they start fighting for you. And that's the story of my life. It's a little poem. I'm reading it because I'm now as a student in, in London. And this poem is on, was chosen for the, would you believe it, for the London Underground poems. You know, tubes, they have poems at each station. And this one was one of them. It's really not about England at all. Palm trees at Chigawe. You stood like women in green proud travelers in Panama hats and Java print. Your fruit milk caused monkeys and shepherds to scramble. 
Your dry leaves were ban ban banner banners for night fishermen. But now stunted trees stand still beheaded, a curious sight for the tourists. When I was a student there, I used to wonder about uh, traveling in London tubes. What we liked was that, unfortunately, um, our time, or my time, as a student coincided with what they called the three-day week. Um, those of you, of you who are as young as I am, people worked for three days. So we went to school for three days. Um, and the rest of the days, we didn't do anything. And so the three-day week spoiled it for us as, as students, as master's students, or PhD students. We couldn't, we couldn't stay for after 5 p.m. because we could not get on the tube to go back home. Um, but what was fascinating was uh, when we traveled in London tubes, the difference between the dust we found back home and the dust we found in the cities. And the point really is the dust at home is rather careless. Whereas the dust in London tubes, you suddenly discover you have been chewing up so much dust without you realizing it until something else happens. Traveling in London tubes. There is something funny about the dust back home. The way it blows naively with the wind carelessly settles on flowers and maize gardens blemishing the green. The way it roars behind the big cars on the dusty roads like cotton wool ashed, leaving you rubbing your eyes like a child. Yet you can avoid it all so easily too. Just keep your head up above or even laugh and let the big cars pass. But here, even the dust is subtle. The way it blows with the seemingly fresh breeze and settles on wind, your window sill, in your eyes and nose, even the dust is subtle here. And it is not until the day is out if you should stand at your window facing the breeze apparently blowing cool. It is not until you are sudden echo that you begin to see how much charcoal was in your nose, your eyes, lungs, traveling in those lovely tubes. <clears throat> now, um, Let's move on, because I don't know what time we are supposed to be stopping for. Is it, is it tea or, or a drink or something? I go back home, and I'm arrested. So I thought I should give you the picture of what actually happened. I don't know whether I will succeed in giving you the picture of what actually happened. If I do succeed, then I will, I'll be a happy man. <clears throat> I 
I went back after my PhD and I started teaching English, um, which I was what I was doing. Um, and I managed as a student in London to publish this book of poems called Of Chameleons and Gods when I was a student. So I was suddenly becoming very famous, according to certain people. The politicians thought, oh, this man is publishing books now. <coughs> the next thing we will hear is he wants leadership. But I didn't want any of that. One day, um, they arrested me. They did not charge me. And this is the type of arrest that happened. Remember, I'm a respectable head of department of English and with 12 members of staff. And um, one day they thought they should arrest me. So they do. They arrested me at a place called Jinkana Club. The British, in their wisdom, brought all these little pubs to the colonies. And uh, we enjoyed ourselves as well after independence. So I was there, sitting with a friend, having a drink, when the police came. And they said, are you Jack Mapanji? Said, yes. Said, oh, come with us. And uh, my friend is worried. He begins to run. He runs to the one of the members of staff of uh, English that I had was um, Father Pat O'Malley that was mentioned. So while he does that, I'm dashed into the police van and I disappeared. I went to the Southern Region Police Station and there um, they said, you sit down here. And I sat there for more than five hours, not knowing what they were going to do to me. What I didn't realize is that by this time, what the police chief was doing is he had invited all police chiefs of the whole country to gather to the Southern Division headquarters to see me, what had happened, you're going to hear in a minute. So just in case, um, this is called a commercial now, just in case you're going to buy this book, <laughs> it's called of Crocodiles, Cro and Crocodiles Are Hungry at Night. After five hours, I'm taken out of this seat and I'm marched towards a, a very big room. Um, and there, who do I see? All police chiefs sitting around. And then um, they point a chair at me, sit here. And this is what happens then. Dr. Mapanje, welcome. And the gentlemen, thank you for making time to come at short notice. Dr. Mapanje, I am Inspector General Elliot Mbeza and the chairman of this country's security council. 
At 11 a.m. this morning, I was summoned by His Excellency, the Life President, the Ngwazi Dr. H. Kamozubanda, to update him on the country's security. I perform such duties every Friday. So is it a coincidence that this Friday I'm reading it? But after, one delib after our deliberations today, His Excellency has directed me to arrest you and imprison you, Dr. Mapanji. He did not tell me why. I did not ask why. And since it's a directive from above, which is from the head of state, I must tell you, we, the police, are not going to investigate your case. It would be questioning the wisdom of the high authorities. I invited these commissioners, therefore, from their posts all over the country to find out if there is anything in our files about you. There is nothing. I repeat, Dr. Mapanje, these commissioners say you are not in our box. So, before we take you to prison, according to the wishes of His Excellency, we thought we should ask you just three questions. Who are you? Why do you think we should detain you and imprison you? What have you done to each other in the university to warrant arrest and imprisonment? I tell you, I was shattered. But this little round table event meant so much to me and them. This meant that my arrest was not known by the police because every arrest is supposed to be known by the police. The reasons are supposed to be. On this occasion, the police claim they do not know anything about me. And the police claim that I am not in their books of the rebel or dissident or whatever. Now, here I am, asked three questions, and my answer is obviously going to betray myself. Because if you say, this is what, these fellows know I'm, I'm a university lecturer and head of department of English, they have all those facts, so how can they ask, who are you? And secondly, how can they ask, why do you, do you think we should detain and imprison you according to the wishes of the president? And we did not ask the president why, we just take directives from him. So I was speechless and I didn't speak and I refused to answer because every answer, any answer I gave would have exposed me. So I said, no way. And you know what he said? So, effectively, since you are refusing to talk to us and tell us why we should arrest you, then tell us, Dr. Mapanji, which schools, colleges, and universities you were educated at, and which countries you recently visited. 
because they have their special branch and the police is scattered around the world. Wherever you went, they will find out whatever you did and so on. But no, I refused to answer. I only said I have been to University of Zimbabwe where I am external examiner in English and Africa in literary linguistics. So the IG Inspector General said, telling his commissioners, gentlemen, could you please ensure that Dr. Mapanje is kept in a prison where the cockroaches are controlled until such time His Excellency decides to have him released. And so I was taken to prison. Effectively, that was my court, my interrogation, my everything. And when I walked into prison, I didn't know where I was and what I was doing. And this was a country where you accuse yourself. The political leaders and the police or whatever refuse to touch you. You will accuse yourself. You will go into prison and the rest of it. Now, what did I do in prison? I will stop there and have a little break. Yes? And then... I will give you the other side of the story and give you what I'm actually doing even now. Um, but I thought um, I should tell you what I did in prison. So I arrive in prison. I do not know what to do. And I discovered that There were about 80 or 90 of us. And the only book we were allowed to read was the Bible. So, 90 people on that side of the prison were about 40, 45 criminal prisoners who were waiting, hanging. And this side of the prison, there were about 45 of us, political prisoners, awaiting either death or release if you are lucky. But the Bible was allowed. We do not know why. If you ask me later, What I know about the Bible, what I knew then, I could challenge you every chapter because the Bible was the only thing we were able to read. And we read from, from cover to cover and started all over again. <clears throat> and it went around. And when it come to, comes to your side, you say, okay, today, All the Old Testament is going to be mine. So this week, I'm going to read it, and, and so on. Um, the other thing that actually happened um, is I discovered that, so I'll keep that one for after the break, because um, One of the things we were doing is trying to survive. We tried to survive in prison um, by telling each other stories and um, or reading the Bible passages and then saying, your interpretation is wrong of the Bible. 
what church did you go to? Especially if he went to the Seventh Day Adventist Church, he protested to the Catholic. Um, Scottish Presbyterian was different, and, and all the churches. You see, this little prison was a macrocosm of the whole world for me. All the fights that the Christians had, all that fight was brought into Africa, and in this prison, we were fighting over interpretation of, of certain aspects of the Bible. If you ask me, I will tell you. I th One of the next things we discovered <clears throat> the famished, stubborn raven, ravens of Mikuyu prison. There were ravens everywhere. These could not be Noah's ravens, these crows of Mikuyu prison groaning on our rooftops each day. Wherever they wandered after their bungled pilgrimages in the aftermath of their, those timeless floods, Noah's ravens could not have landed here. They never returned to the Ruth, their master's ark. This could not be Elijah's ravens either, for however stubbornly this nation might challenge Lord Almighty's frogs, these devouring locusts, the endless droughts and plagues, today there is no prophet God so loves as to want to rescue with the bread and meat from messenger ravens. This could only be from the heathen stock of famished crows and carrion vultures sent here to pick at our insomnia and agony blood eyes and to club the peace of this desert cell with their tough knocking beaks. And why don't they choose some other place and some other time? Why must these crows happen at Mikuyu prison, always at dawn, hammering at the corrugated iron of this cell, drilling at the marrow of our fragile bones, and picking at the fish bones, thieved? from the dust bins we ditched outside. After the break, I'll read you the one about skipping without rope. This is the little thing that we were supposed to be doing. We sat there and we said, we are not allowed anything. No, we could not go anywhere, um, remember, we are allowed, we sit there, we do not know when we are going to be released because we are not charged. Political prisoners did not go to court, so they, they were not charged, and they did not know how long they will stay there. So you needed to exercise and to do various jobs for yourself. One of them is skipping without rope, because you are not even allowed rope to do anything. <laughs> okay, can I stop there for a while? And uh, okay. <clears throat> Can we start then? Um, if you have a question, you, you can put a question and then we can do the reading within the context of the question. So don't fear asking questions. 
Um, some questions are so good that they remind me of something that I was supposed to write about in prison. And because uh, I, I, I was in, I was in Vienna several years ago, and uh, somebody asked me a question, and I remembered the poem, which I had not had time to put down on, on paper. So don't fear asking even rude questions. <laughs> you can. Um, so we, we made life, you know, pleasant for ourselves. It wasn't pleasant at all, I can tell you that. It was not pleasant, but we survived by laughing. Laughter is a very good medicine. Because um, if you are imprisoned and you do not know when you are going to get out, if you are going to get out, um, then you, you have to have a strategy for survival. Some of the strategies are reading the Bible, hearing other people's stories, and um, sometimes we used to invent stories for, I mean, you could tell that this one is telling me this story or us this story, but it did not happen. But we still believe him, because there is nothing else to do <laughs> but to believe him. So false stories, not, not, not the Trump type of thing. <laughs> uh, uh, this is real stories. One, one of the things that we used to do is, um, when I think of it now, they did not, um, usually they did not allow us to go out for a shower. Um, even if you stink. This was supposed to be part of the punishment. You stink. And um, so what, what the fellows did was to create the stench. And then after creating the stench, you asked them to take you for a shower because you were stinking. And um, this is the origin of Skipping Without Rope, this, this book of poems. Skipping without rope, I will. I will skip without your rope, since you say I should not. I cannot borrow your son's skipping rope to exercise my limbs. I will skip without your rope, as you say, even the lace I want will hang in my neck until I die. I will create my own rope, my own hope, and skip without your rope. As you insist, I do not require to stretch my limbs fixed by these fevers of your reeking sweat and your prison walls. I will, will skip with my forged hope. Watch, watch me skip without your rope, watch Rob, watch me skip with my hope. A one, a two, a three, a four, a five. I will, a seven, I do, will skip. A ten, eleven, I'll skip without, skip within, and skip I do without your rope, but with my hope. And I will, will always skip you dull, will skip your silly rules, skip your filthy walls, your weave or pigeon peas, skip your scorpions, skip your excellency, life glory. I do, you don't, I can, you can't, I will, you won't, I see, you don't, I sweat, ma, I sweat, you don't, I will, will wipe my blue, gluey brow, then wipe you at a stroke, I will. We wipe your horrid, stinking, vulgar prison rules. We we'll wipe you all, then hope about, hope about myself, my home, the mountains, the globe as your sparrow hopes about your prison yard without your hope, without your rope. I swear, 
I will skip without your rope, I declare. I will throw you, I will have you take me to your showers to bathe me, where I can resist this singing child you want to shape me. I will fight your rope, your rules, your hope, as your sparrow does under your supervision. Gods, take us for the shower. And the God would be forced, because by that time we will be stinking, and they will be forced to take us for a shower. Um, I think what I will do now is read once. I've seen some of you have, have bought this, so, but might as well. There are sections of this, of this book which are I'm not just doing a commercial for this book. It's, uh, there are sections which are very good. Um, if I can remember, where is it? I mean, it is... Three, six, one. So I have stayed in prison for three years, seven months, and so on. One day, um, I am um, invited to the officer in charge. So the officer in charge says, um, we've had a telephone from the authorities they would like us to tell you to take you um, to the higher authorities in Blantyre. They are wanting you, and so I did not know what to think of this because sometimes political prisoners were taken like that, and that was the end of the story. They disappeared. So you can imagine you've been told um, then I had courage. I said, what do you think, sir, the, the reason could be for the authorities to want me in Blantyre? I said, I do, he said, I do not know. So he, he says, uh, there are three ways. Either you are going to be transferred to another prison, because they could do that any time. And in that case, take your sugar, take whatever it is that you have, and take it with you, because you may not find what you had here in the other place. Otherwise, they might have now discovered what wrong you had done. After three, three years, seven months, they have discovered what you did wrong. And so they are going to charge you. But if that happens, then prepare to come back here because people like you can only come to this prison. But if it is uh, something else, we will hear because at one o'clock when the car comes to take you, we always send the car with our officers. So the officer will tell us exactly what, where you have been, so that when your wife and the children come, we will tell them, he was taken by officers, and this officer says this is what has happened to your husband. So I went there. One o'clock, they came to pick me up. I went to the headquarters. And you can read the rest of the story, but I just thought I should read you this one. I have now arrived at the headquarters of the police for the person, person who is Inspector General 
of police is a different person. The one, when I was arrested, this young man was only um, head of special branch of the police. But now he is full-blooded inspector of the police, so he's in charge of the whole police. So he says to me, Dr. Mapanji, how are you? And I answered carefully, as healthy as a prisoner can be, sir. I understand, he says, with some concern, and continues, well, Dr. Mapanji, it may have taken me long, but if you remember the last time we met, and there is, I describe in the book the last time we met, I made a pledge that I'll bring, I would bring your case to His Excellency's attention myself, as I had direct access to him. I want to report that from the time I promised you, I have been trying hard to persuade His Excellency to have you released. But every time I put my, your name down up for the consideration, the HE himself either refused to sign my memo or he sent me out of his office empty handed. Very frustrating indeed. Do you remember Blaise Machiland? And this was a friend of ours in the English department who was, after my arrest, he was also arrested for protesting about me. Do you remember Machira and George Ntafu? George Ntafu was trained as a neurosurgeon in Germany by some of the best neurosurgeon ever, German ever had. And Malawi had only that neurosurgeon. And they created a reason for putting him in prison. Do you remember George Ntafu released from your prison? in January this year. So these two were released in January. And this is May. I do, sir. Well, initially I proposed five names, including yours, for the life president to consider releasing you in January. He pulls out his drawer and says, here, read this. He offers me the memo and he wrote, that he wrote to the president on the matter. I see clearly the five names he had recommended. The first was this, the second was that. And then he continues, Dr. Mapanji, what do you see in the margin against each of the four names I recommended to? And I, I see the word approved, sir, against each name, followed by His Excellency's initial and date. And what do you see against your name? After checking his memo there again, I answered, I see the word never, sir, followed by the President's initials and date. And he says, my friend, you were a prisoner, political prisoner, never to be released. Then he pulls out, he says, but today, which is May the 10th, 1991, I confronted His Excellency, the Life President, again. He pulls out another memo from his drawer and he decides to read it himself, read it aloud. He's, he had written this. As His Excellency's official birthday is about to be celebrated on 14th of May, and it is the custom for heads of state throughout the world to release a selected number of political prisoners on their official birthdays, we, Your Excellency's trusted police service, propose that 
In your wisdom, your excellency might like to consider releasing at your forthcoming birthday the following prisoners, whom we believe to have repented of the wrongs they were believed to have committed against your person and the state. We are sorry to have to say, however, that the list we provide has only one name, Dr. Jack Papanji. If your excellency, the life president, the father and founder of this nation, you can see now how, how clever he is now, um, should feel pleased to release Dr. Jack Mabanji. We, your most trusted police force, will ensure that Dr. Mapanje is under your excellency's most dependable and strict surveillance at all times. Longuzi passes the memo on to me to confirm that for myself what he has been reading to me. I see my name right in the middle of the memo. Dr. Mapanje, what do you see in the margin of the memo recent, of my recent memo to His Excellency? Ha! My heart jumps in disbelief. I see the word approved, sir. And it's followed by the President's initials and today's date. I also see a big full stop, sir. Thank you for your sharp observation, Dr. Mapanji. As for the full stop, His Excellency Penn paused there today, as it has always done on similar occasions. At that point, he must have been considering whether to cancel his signature, give me back the memo, and throw me out of his office, which he had done before, or to go ahead and sign the memo. But after a minute of pondering, His Excellency finally lifted his pen, put it, put it back into its ink pot, and gave me back my memo signed and dated. Dr. Mapanje, may I take this opportunity to declare that it has Please, His Excellency, the Life President of the Republic of Malawi, Benghazi, Dr. H. Kamuzubanda, to have you released from prison with, forthwith and without preconditions. And this, I think, is a miracle. I repeat, Dr. Mapanche, this is a miracle. Therefore, go home to your wife and children at Ncheo District Hospital before His Excellency changes his mind. And let me categorically assure you that we will not be under, you will not be under our surveillance. What I promise His Excellency is our, our way of talking to him as a civil, civil servant. Then he goes on. You see, Dr. Mapanje, there are many versions of the causes of your improvement, imprisonment in the university and outside it that my staff, prison staff, were surprised and often confused. We still do not know what happened to you in the university or who reported what to His Excellency. So, tell me, who are you? Look, sir, I said, I do not know who I really am myself. But I suppose you could say I am only a linguist who happened to write poetry. In truth, I am an ordinary university lecturer. That's who I am, I think, sir. Thank you for your cooperation. Let me take this opportunity to inform you 
that at this point in time, there are only, and this is the revelation that I am getting, there are only three people in the whole world wide, wide world who know that you are being freed. His Excellency the Life President, myself, and yourself. There are only three people. Nobody else knows that you are leaving prison today. I repeat, Dr. Mapanje, people will hear about your release only after I have told our embassies and high commissions and representatives throughout the world that you have been released. Go. So go back to Mikuyu now, collect your property, stay in Zomba town at the rest house or with a friend tonight, and tomorrow get the bus warrants from Zomba Eastern Division Police or Police Headquarters to take you home. So I said, if you don't mind, sir, I have already taken my property. What? Did you know that you were coming here to be released? No, sir. Of course not. You see, sir, when you invite us to, to see you this far, prison officers in charge always recommend that we take our property with us in case you want us to be transferred to other prisons. In fact, what I am wearing, uh, the little bag I am carrying, is the only property I possessed in prison. Sir, I understand, says the he. And sir, I have a friend in Zomba town where I can spend the night. Good. And finally, Dr. Mapanche, let me take this opportunity to tell you that His Excellency, the Life President, has given you permission to go back to your job in the university with immediate effect. But in fact, when I went back to the university, they did not understand how I was released and who released me. This is where I knew that perhaps it was somebody in the university who was influential, and he started. Um, he recommended that I be arrested. OK, so what I have now is uh, I want to read you. I've seen some of you have read the, this. Um, has, I've bought a greetings from Grandpa, which is my latest book of poems. Um, and Beasts of Nalunga. Um, I came to England recommended by the British High Commissioner, it, which is strange. British High Commissioners never recommend directly. But he became a very good friend because of the campaigns that were happening in the UK. In fact, throughout the world, Germany, France, um, uh, Ireland, and so on, Austria, everybody was protesting about my case. And so because of that, he was bound to get it, to become friends. So he says, uh, invited me after my release. And when the university were reluctant to give me back my job in the university, he said, come, we have a story for you. So I went there, and I discovered that the German embassy, the American embassy, and the British High Commission had decided that I should leave the country um, because it was going to become very dangerous for me. What usually happens is if 
a political prisoner is released without the knowledge of the people who recommended that I be released, then they would find a way, usually after one or two years, when he will have forgotten about it, they sent a hitman. So they said, uh, we recommend that you leave the country and join your friends somewhere outside. And um, we will be responsible for it. We will tell the special branch man, that's the man who, who released me, we will tell him that he has got a, a scholarship or something. So I decided to leave the country with my wife and children and this is why you see me here. Um, it was a tough time to leave one's country. If it is your country and you, you, you're such a stubborn man as I was, I wanted to be killed there or just live there, whatever happened. And then you are told, look, it's safe for you and your wife and children to go away. It's better that way in order for you to be alive. That is what I did. I left the country and went to England against my will. Now while I was there, um, yeah, I can read you the first serious poem I wrote when I arrived. I arrived in England and the, one of the poems I wrote was this one. Um, yeah. Arrive um, on a scholarship. The seashells of Bridlington North Beach. What happens is we went to the beach and um, it reminded us of home. My wife and children just dashed to the sea on the sand and they enjoyed every minute of it. And so the first poem, which the English think it's a good poem, we think it's not a poem at all, is this. The seashells of Bridlington North Beach. She hated anything caged, fish particularly. Fish caged in glass boxes, ponds, whatever. Reminds me of prison and slavery, she said. So when first she caught the vast green view of Bridlington North Beach, Shimmering that English summer day, she greeted the sight like a Sahara girl on parched feet, capping, capping, capping the water madly, laundering her palms, giggling and laughing. Then rubbing the, the hands on her skirt, she threw her bottom on the sandy beach and let the sea breathe in and out on her as she relaxed her crossed legs. Free at last, she announced to the beach crowds oblivious. And as the seascape rallied and vanished at her feet, she mapped her world. The Netherlands we visited must be there. Norway, Sweden, there. Beyond that, Russia. Then gathering more seashells and selecting them one by one, she turned to him. Do you remember eating porridge with beef shells once? He nodded, smiling at another memory of the African lakes they were forced to abandon. Someday, perhaps I will take that home to celebrate, she said, staring into the deep sea. Today her egg-like egg pebbles, her pearls of seashells still sparkle at the windowsill. Her wishes still ring. Change regularly the water in the receptacles 
to keep the pebbles and seashells shining. You will see it's a healthier, it's a lot healthier than fishing, than, than feeding caged fish. So I decided after living here for a long time and living in the UK, not, not Luxembourg, to go back home. The dictator had died, but his apparatus was still around. So I decided to go back home. And um, yeah, OK. Let me read you this one. When you get out of there and you are free, um, you don't want to go on protesting because you are free. Um, so when I went home, um, the first shock, I didn't tell anybody that I had arrived. Um, because the apparatus was still intact and still there. But the first shock I had was the shock of discovering that a lot of my friends had died of AIDS. And I had not written a poem about AIDS. I did not want to write one. It just happened to me that when I visited a, f a family, the woman there said, your friend is buried. Come and see where your friend is buried. The note, or returning home. This is it, she said, pointing at the mound with the Bible she had brought from the house. This is where we buried your brother. And it's not the shock of thieves stealing the wreaths we heaped on his mound, only to sell them again to their next bereaved client, which bothered me. That's norm today. It's my discovering two months before your visit what had troubled my dearest man the last years of his the last years of our lives together. And why didn't I open these pages of the Bible before his passing? She strikes her chest, beads of tears running down her cheeks. <clears throat> then pulls out the note. This is what has been wrenching my heart since I unearthed it. Darling, you said I tormented you when I turned the other side each time you joked about yearning for another kid. I'm sorry, but I did not know how to tell you. One infidelity gave me the incurable curse and I did not wish to pass it on. I love you and the children dearly. You will always be my finest, finest angels. Forgive me and pray when I am gone. He had placed that note between the leaves of St. Paul's letter to the Romans we often discussed, she says. He knew I'd find it in the end, just that it took forever. I wiped my teardrops, which fell on the pages that had kept their note, scooped dust with my bare hands and fling it at our gallons leading her to the car, we drive back silent. When I went to, um, let me read this one before you get too tired, because this is called 
um, audience participation. Um, in African traditions, the audience is supposed to participate. Now, I'd like you to participate. Are you ready? Good. <laughs> OK. Um, I would like you to just hit the table or something. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two. Oh, brilliant. I think, I think you'll be Af good Africans. <laughs> OK. So, so I will read, and then on the material time, you will hit, yeah? OK. So uh, I'm going to sing a song. Jambi timbi, jambi timbi, ali tunukulambam. Very good. No, no. Jambi, jambi timbi, ali tunukulambam. One, two, two. Jambi timbi, jambi timbi, ali tunukulambam. Ati teje nga agunya, anye lele pezo mwa. Ani ndepelepo, ani ndepelepo. Brilliant. This is my story. When uh, I saw that, I'll be political now. I saw Greece humiliated by, by the union. I felt very, very ashamed. I, then you can guess what the poem is about. What it is, is a very simple thing. It's again based on the African environment. Once upon a time, the hyena told everybody that it never went to the latrine. And so it, it enjoyed all the food and all the festivities and and everybody was wondering why when does this hyena go to the toilet because it never and it declared that it will never go to the toilet because the hyena is special until one day it was what was being eaten was so full but because he was ashamed of going to the toilet. He decided to go towards a, a secret um, mountain or rock, which was dedicated to the gods. And so he went there, and he shut there, <laughs> and came back. And then both, whatever came from his Tummy, and what the gods were doing followed him until, and they were singing, until Hyena discovers <laughs> that somebody's singing behind me, he was not safe. Okay, Jambi Timbi, Jambi Timbi, Alitunukulamba. Jambi timbi, jambi timbi, ali tunukulamba. Ati teje nga akunya, anyelele pesoma. Ani ndepelepo, ani ndepelepo. Now that they have brought Athena down, that's the title. Now that they have brought Athena down to her knees, split the logs Clear the fireplace, gather the dry twigs, make the fire. Sit the kids around the lapping flames and sing bird songs as the ancients did. Jambitimbi, jambitimbi, ali tunukulamba. Jambitimbi, jambitimbi, ali tunukulamba. Ati tejenga kunya. Lele pezoma, ani ndepelepo, 
aninde pelepo. So, seeing this hyena, seeing of the hyena who feasted himself stupid every day, and claimed he never saw the latrine all his life, captivating listeners as he stuffed himself ever more and more. Seeing of the day when hyena abruptly felt himself painfully clambering the top of a local rock nobody had ever dared, there to squat and empty his troubling, rumbling, weary belly, then creep back home as if planet Earth never happened. Sing of the wrath of the gods who, trailing the stench that hyena had deposited, on their sacred rock, marched after him, crying foul, chanting about greed and the folly of man. Jambitimbi, jambitimbi, ali tunukulamba. Jambitimbi, jambitimbi, ali tunukulamba. Atiteje nga kunya, anyelele pezoma, aninde pelepo. Aninde Perepo. Very good. You are very good singers. I've made you into singers today, but I would like to thank you for fundraising for Umod, uh, which is this project is about. Um, please, if you have a bit more, you have already, you have already put a, put a, a thing. Yeah. Um, are you, are you bringing the plate here? Are you bringing the Sunday collection? <laughs> okay. Has anybody got a question before we finally close then? One or two questions, and don't, don't worry if it is a stupid, you think it's a stupid question. Stupid questions are the best ones. Yeah. Um, I'm Jonathan. Um, question. We did those three years. Were you allowed to see family or your family or Uh, during the three years and seven months in prison, were you allowed to see the, the family or the family? Have ever, did they ever see your face when you were inside? It Thank took you. 22 months. It's a very good question. It took 22 months for my wife and the three children to come and see me. And it was a, a real miracle. When you, if you've read that, if you got that, then uh, you find it explained there. But it was difficult, and uh, one of them, not only did I have, did I cry when they, they arrived after 22 months, because it was a surprise. I just said, oh, Mapanje is needed at the office. And uh, you went to the office, you did not know what, what was happening. And we had to discover that my wife and three children were there. And I looked at them, they looked at us, at me. We both shed tears. Um, and as each one of us was crying about each other, uh, Judith was the only one who picked up courage. I said, so dad, what is, what is it really like to be here? Um, <laughs> it was a very dangerous question, actually, <laughs> because if I said what it was like, then, then they would be, because they are all listening in, the officers. And so, I, so I, I, in life, you occasionally find a, a good lie. So this one was one of them. Oh, it's very nice here. We're happy. <laughs> 
when you knew that they, we were not happy at all. Um, and the, the other question came, and this was the first meeting after 22 months. I mean, these fellows did not know that I was still alive. We were exchanging little notes. They became mature very quickly. They knew that the, their dad was still alive, but uh, they wanted him to see him physically. And my son there, he was, um, I think, five and a half, who is the DJ today. Um, he sat on my lap <coughs> and he says, <coughs> Dad, is it true that you stole something from the university? That's why you are here. <laughs> It was a lovely question, uh, in the sense that I said, what, what do you, why, why are you saying that? He says, uh, my friends at school are mocking me. They're saying, oh, the son of a, a thief who's, who stole things, <laughs> and so on. It was, but it was extremely painful, um, as you can, you can imagine. But, oh, we were happy. Happily together, and then they left, and we had stories to tell in the cells there um, as to the first time. This is the first time after 22 months. So if the government has allowed this, your family to come after 22 months, then there is something that was going on out there. That's when we discovered that there was a lot of campaign um, everywhere, in fact. In fact, the first, um, the first African country that broadcast my story was Tanzania. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other quick, quick question or any questions again? Um, the, the song you made it part participate in uh, was obviously not in English. My question is about languages. I mean, have you always written in English? Um, would you, or have you considered writing in any other language that you obviously speak? Um, and why? <laughs> it's a very good question. No, a very good question. When I knew that I was going to come to talk to you, I decided that I was going to start with the a poem in my language. But I, I gave that up and I decided no. During the time of our president, when we became independent, quickly there was a cabinet crisis. And so the country which was united in, the fi in fighting the British was divided. Um, Dr. Banda, our head of state, did not like uh, to be free, be democratic, um, be opening up to Russia or China and so on. That, those years ago, this is the six days we are talking about. Now, because of that, the rest of the cabinet, his own cabinet, decided, let's tell him before it's too late to be free. But he picked up courage and he says, I'm going to suck you. So he sucked six of the, the best, uh, the most, the cleverest cabinet ministers. And that, was the, that is why after that cabinet crisis, Dr. Banda chose one dialect of the language and made it a national language and he stopped us all from speaking, or at least writing, in the other languages. So I have written one poem. I wrote one poem, actually, out of rudeness in my language. And that poem, this book here is called Of Chameleons and Gods. This is the first book of poems that I wrote. Now, 
The Chameleons and Gods was the first poem in my local language translated. But since that time, I have not written. I, and that, I wrote that poem <clears throat> um, and translated it into Chichewa, Dr. Banda's language, and had the Chichewa version read on the radio, and people liked it, but they didn't know who had written it, because if they had known I had written it, they would not have gone there. It's about the chameleon. Kuyenda wana nzikambe, kodi ndiponde, kodi mpabwino, kodi mpoyela, andiponda, kuyenda wana nzikambe. Nanga mwendo huu, kodi mpoyela, kodi mpabwino, andiponda, nanga wana nzikambe. Atamba sula mwendo, na ufunye. Mwina kawiri, mwina katatu. Asa na ponde. Atsimikisi kuenda kwa nanzikambe. Ndieza kazi. So, the walking of a, a chameleon. Shall I put the foot down? Shall I not put it down? Shall I? Or shall I not? Ah, I'll put it down. <laughs> and so on, yeah? Now, what was interesting is the Chinyanja or Chichewa version of it was loved by people who were listening to the radio because <clears throat> it sounded like listening to Radio Luxembourg. <laughs> were you there when Radio Luxembourg was? We were students in London and we enjoyed every moment of Radio Luxembourg. Every moment, because it represented rebellion <laughs> for, for most of the fellows in, in, in London and so on. These fellows said, your, your um, song of a chameleon is very good because it is showing that we are living in a country where it is very difficult for you to do anything. You have to be as careful as the chameleon. Before you do anything, work anything, write anything, talk, you must check. Is it safe? Is it not safe? Shall I do it? Or shall I not do it? And that's the type of life we were living. That's why of chameleons and gods it was the best book I have ever written in the sense that I was able to write something that was deliberately, or not even deliberately, was misunderstood by authority. <laughs> in other words, you were writing at the time, whatever you did, you did everything you could to protect yourself. You used traditions like boom, boom, boom you knew well, very well that you're talking about politics and you're saying, how greedy can the world be? It's so greedy, it's, it's absolutely incredible. Um, any other question? Did you want to ask a question? No? Oh. I'm interested how, how do you Which language Okay. Chiao was the language. The first poem was written in Chiao, and I could not write in Chiao. Um, so what I did was I translated the Chiao into the Chichewa, which I could not even write the Chichewa properly because the Chichewa had too many rules. Um, we were even suggesting in the university, go to France, learn how the, the French <laughs> dug up their language and ensured that is, this is the type of French academy, yes? Yeah. We said to them, you should go there and learn how they've done it. But the fellows who were doing the Chichewa, making it a national language, did not even have a clue of what the thing was about. And I am a linguist myself. I actually lent them my only copy of on code lexicology, stroke lexicography, 
of language, of natural language, which I got from uh, Professor Randolph Quirk, my tutor at University College London. I sent, I get, gave my, it showed you how to collect data for di dictionaries and, and how to preserve words, etc., etc. My book never came back to me. And in fact, when I went to prison, it just disappeared. Okay, so it's a good question. My sister-in-law rang up about four months ago and said, there is a new dispensation here in Malawi. Do you remember you used to write poems in the local language? I said, yes. Well, the National Examinations Library Council has included one of your poems in the local language as part of GCSE examinations. And I found it very difficult to answer questions. Why don't you come here so that I can ask you the meaning of this poem <laughs> which you wrote in the local language? The meaning now, there is a, it's a free world. I can, anybody can write in as many languages as possible as they can speak. But for some of us, it's too late because uh, my Chiao is completely gone. Well, not completely gone. I can still remember Chi Chiao. My, my Chi Chiao is totally gone, but I can still speak it broken or whatever. If I had the time to write in the local language, this time would be the best time for me to do that. <laughs>